The legend of Malkin Tower, on the brow of a high hill, forming part of the range of Pendle, and commanding an extensive view over the forest and the wild and mountainous region around it, stands a stern and solitary tower, old as Anglo-Saxon, and built as a stronghold by Wolstan a Northumbrian thane in the time of Edmund or Edrell. It is circular in form and very lofty, and serves as a landmark to the country round. Placed high up in the building, the door was formerly reached by a sea flight of stone set, but these were removed some fifty or sixty years ago by Mother Demdi and a ladder capable of being raised or let down, a pleasure substitute for them, affording the only apparent means of entry. The tower is otherwise inaccessible, the walls being of immense thickness, with no window lower than five and twenty feet from the ground. Though it is thought there must be a secret outlet for the old witch when she wants to come forth, does not wait for the ladder to be let down. This may be otherwise explained. Internally, there are three floors, the lowest being placed on a level with the door, and this is the apartment chiefly occupied by the high. In the centre of this room is a trap door, opening upon a deep vault, which forms the basement story of the structure, and which was once used as a dungeon, but is now tenanted. It is said by a mind who can be summoned by the wish on stamping her foot. Round the room runs a gallery, contrived in the thickness of the walls, while the upper chambers are gained by a secret staircase, and closed by a movable stone, the machinery of which is only known to the inmates of the tower. All the rooms are lighted by narrow loopholes, thus you will see that the fortress is still capable of sustaining a siege, and all them deep has been heard to declare that she would hold it for a month against a hundred men. Hitherto it has proved impregnable. On the Norman invasion, Malkin Tower was held by a Uthred, a descendant of Wolstan, who kept possession of Pendle Forest and the hills around it, and successfully resisted the aggressions of the conquerors. His enemies affirmed he was assisted by a demon, whom he had propitiated by some fearful sacrifice made in the tower, and the notion seen borne out by the success uniformly attending his complex. Uthred's prowess was stained by cruelty and rapine, merciless in the treatment of his captives putting them to death by horrible tortures, or immuring them in the dark and noisome dungeon of his tower. He would hold his revels over their heads, and deride their throne. Heaps of treasure obtained by pillage were secured by him in the tower, from his frequent acts of treachery, and the many foul murders he perpetrated. Ultred was styled the scourge of the Norman. For a long period, he enjoyed complete immunity punishment, but after the siege of York and the defeat of the insurgents, his destruction was vowed by Ibert Ilese, Lord of Lavenshire, and this fierce chieftain set fire to part of the forest in which the Saxon vein and his followers were concealed, drove them to Malkin Tower, took it after an obstinate and prolonged defence, and considerable loss to himself, and put them all to the sword except the leader, whom he hanged from the top of his own fortress. In the dungeon were found many carcasses, and the greater part of Ultred's treasure served to enrich the victor. Once again in the reign of Henry the Sixth, Malkin Tower became a robber's stronghold, and gave protection to a rebooter named Blackburn, who, with a band of daring and desperate marauders, took advantage of the troubled state of the country, ravaged it far and wide, and committed unheard of atrocities, even levying contributions upon the abbeys of Warley and Sally, and the heads of these religious establishments were glad to make terms with him to save their herds and so on, the rather that all attempts to dislodge him from his mountain fastness and destroy his band had failed. Blackburn seemed to enjoy the same kind of protection as Ultred, and practiced the same atrocities, torturing and imprisoning his captives unless they were heavily ransomed. He also led a life of wildest license, and when not engaging in some predatory exploits, spent his time in carousing with his followers. Upon one occasion, it chanced that he made a visit in disguise to Wally Abbott, and passing the little hermitage near the church, behold the votaress who tenanted it. This was Isol de Hetton. Ravished by her wondrous beauty, Blackburn soon found an opportunity of making his passion known to her, and his handsome though fierce liniments pleasing her, he did not long sigh in vain. He frequently visited her in the garb of a Cistercian monk, and being taken for one of the brethren, his conduct brought great scandal upon the abbey. The abandoned votaress bore him a daughter, and the infant was conveyed away by the lover, and placed under the care of a peasant's wife at Barrowford. From that child sprang Bess Blackburn, the mother of all them died, so that the witch is a direct descendant of Isol the Hetton. Notwithstanding all precautions, Isol dark events became known, and she would have paid the penalty of it at the stake if she had not fled. In scaling Wally Nab in the woody heights of which she was to remain concealed till her lover come to her, she fell from a rock, shattering her limbs and disfiguring her features. Some say she was lame for life, and became as hideous as she had hereto for being lovely. But this is erroneous, for apprehensive of such a result, ended by the loss of her lover, she involved the power of darkness, and proffered her soul in return for five years of unimpaired beauty. The 
compact was made, and when Blackburn came, he found her more beautiful than ever. Enraptured, he conveyed her to Mountain Tower and lived with her there in security, laughing to scorn the menaces of Abbot Eccles, by whom he was excommunicated. Time went on, and as I saw charm underwent no change, her lover's adore continued unabated. Five years passed in guilty pleasures, and the last day of the allotted term arrived. No change was manifest in my soul's demeanor, neither remorse nor fear were exhibited by her. Never had she appeared more lovely, never in higher or more exuberant spirits she besought her lover, who was still madly intoxicated by her infernal charm, to give a banquet that night to ten of his trustiest followers. He willingly assented and bade them to the feast. They ate and drank merrily, and the gayest of the company was the lovely eyes soul. Her spirits seemed somewhat too wild even to Blackburn, but he did not check her, though surprised at the excessive liveliness and freedom of her sallies. Her eyes flashed like fire, and there was not a man present but was madly in love with her, and ready to dispute for her smiles with his captain. The wine flowed freely, and song and jest went on till midnight. When the hour struck, I saw filled a cup to the brim, and called upon them to pledge her. All arose, and drained their goblets enthusiastically. It was a farewell cup, she said. I am going away with one of you. How? exclaimed Blackburn in angry surprise. Let any one but touch your hand, and I will strike him dead at my feet. The rest of the company regarded each other with surprise, and it was then discovered that a stranger was amongst them, a tall dark man whose looks were so terrible and demoniacal that no one dared lay hands upon him. I am come, he said, with evil significance to I soul, and I am ready, she answered boldly. I will go with you, were it to the bottomless pit, cried Blackman, catching hold of her. It is thither I am going, she answered with a scream of laughter. I shall be glad of a companion. When the paroxysm of laughter was over, she fell down on the floor. Her lover would have raised her when what was his horror to find that he held in his arm an old woman with rightfully disfigured features, and evidently in the agonies of death she fixed one look upon him and expired. Terrified by the occurrence, the guests hurried away, and when they returned the next day, they found Blackburn stretched on the floor and quite dead. They cast his body together with that of the wretched eyes soul into the vault beneath the room where they were lying, and then taking possession of his treasures, removed to some other retreat. Thenceforth, the mountain tower became haunted, though wholly deserted. The lights were constantly seen shining from it at night, and sounds of wild revelry, succeeded by shrieks and groans, issued from it. The figure of Isol was often seen to come forth and flit across the waste in the direction of Wally Abbey. On stormy nights, a huge black cat with flaming eyes was frequently descried on the summit of the structure, whence it obtained its name of Grimalkin or Malkin Tower. The ill omened pile ultimately came into the possession of the Nutter family, but it was never tenanted until assigned, as I have already mentioned to Mother MD. The Chirurgeon's marvellous story was listened to with great attention by his auditors. Most of them were familiar with different versions of it, but to Master Potts it was altogether new, and he made rapid notes of it, questioning the narrator as to one or two points which appeared to him to require explanation. Nicholas, as heart may be told, was particularly interested in that part of the legend which referred to Isol the Hetton. He now, for the first time, heard of her unhallowed intercourse with the reboot of Blackburn, of her compact on Walling now with find of her mysterious connection with Malkin Tower, and of her being the ancestress of Mother Dendy. The consideration of all these points, coupled with a vivid recollection of his own strange adventure with the impious slaughterers at the Abbey on the previous night, plunged him into a deep train of thought, and he began seriously to consider whether he might not have committed some heinous sin, and indeed jeopardised his soul's welfare by dancing with her. What if I should snare the same fate as the robber Blackburn, he ruminated, and be dragged to perdition by her? It is a very awful reflection, although my fate might operate as a warning to others, I am by no means anxious to be held up as a modern scarecrow. Rather, let me take warning myself, amend my life, abandon intemperance, which leads to all manner of wickedness, and suffer myself no more to be ensnared by the wiles and delusions of temper. In the form of a fair woman, no, no, I will alter and amend my life, leaving the squire, however, to his cogitations, so turning to his memorandum book, in which he was still engaged in writing, and the others to their talk, he shall proceed to the chamber, whither the whole miller had been led by Bess. When visited by the rector, he had been apparently sued by the worthy man's consolatory advice, but when left alone, he speedily relapsed into his former dark and gloomy state of mind. He did not notice Bess, who, according to Holden's directions, placed the aquavite bottle before him, but as long as she stayed, remained with his face buried in his hands. As soon as she was gone, he arose, and began to pace the room to and fro. The window was open, and he could hear the funeral bell tolling mournfully at intervals. Each recurrence of the dismal sound added sharpness and intensity to his grief. His sufferings became almost intolerable, and drove him to the very verge of despair and madness. If a weapon had been at hand, he might have seized it, and 
example, a sudden period to his existence. His breast was a chaos of fears and troubled thoughts, in which one black and terrible idea arose and overpowered all the rest. It was a desire of vengeance, deep and complete, upon her whom he looked on as a murderess of his child. He cared not how it were accomplished, so it was done. But such was the opinion he entertained of the old has power that he doubted his ability to the task. Still, as a bell tolled on, the furies at his heart lashed and goaded him on and yelled in his ear, Revenge! Revenge! Now, indeed, he was crazed with grief and rage. He tore off and pulled the air, plunged his nails deeply into his breast, and while committing these and other wild excesses with frantic imprecations, he called down heaven's judgments on his own head. He was in that lost and helpless state when the enemy of mankind has power over man, nor was the opportunity neglected, for when the wretch Baldwin, exhausted by the violence of his emotion, had leaned for a moment against the wall, he perceived to his surprise that there was a man in the room, a small person attired in rusty black, whom he thought had been one of the party in the adjoining chamber. There was an expression of mockery about this person's countenance which did not please the miller, and he asked him sternly what he wanted. Leave offering in, mon, he said fiercely, or I may be tempted to take you away the throttle and make you laugh on the wrong side of your mouth. No, no, you will not, Richard Baldwin. When you know my errand, replied the man, you are thirsting for vengeance upon Mother M.D. You shall have it. I, I, you promised me vengeance before, cried Miller. Vengeance by the law. But I am on way too long for it. I would have it swift and sure, deep and deadly. I would blast her with curses. Us who blasted my poor Mary. I would strike her dead at my feet. That's my vengeance, man. You shall have it, replied the other. You're told differently for all what you did just now, man, said Miller, regarding it narrowly and distrustfully. And you look differently too. There's a queer glimmer about you that I didn't notice before, and that I misliked. The man laughed bitterly. Leave off grinning or be gone, cried Baldwin furiously. And he raised his hands to strike the man, but he instantly dropped it. A whole vile look which overthrew him. Who the jewel are you? The jewel must answer you since you appealed to him, replied the other with the same mocking smile. But you are mistaken in supposing that you were spoken to me for. He with whom you converse in the open room resembles me in my respect and want, but he does not possess power equal to mine. The law will not aid you against Mother Demdi. She will escape all the snares laid for her, but she will not escape me. Who are ye? cried the Miller, his air erecting on his head, and cold damp breaking out on his brow. You are not mortal, and not good talk in this fashion. He not who and what I am, replied the other. I am known here as a reeve of the forest. That is enough. Would you have vengeance on the murderess of your child? Yeah, rejoined Baldwin. And you are willing to pay for it at the price of your soul, demanded the other, advancing towards him. Baldwin reeled. He saw at once the fearful peril in which he was placed, and averted his gaze from the scorching glance of the reeve. At this moment, the door was tried without, and the voice of S was heard saying, Who are you? Got we, uh, Rochard, and why have you fastened the door? Your answer demanded the reeve. I cannot get in now, replied the miller. Come in, Bess, come in. I cannot, she replied. Open the door. Your answer, I say, said the reeve. Give me an hour to think on it, said the miller. Agreed, replied the other. I will be with you after the funeral. And he sprang through the window and disappeared before Baldwin could open the door and I'd be best.